I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about public services. It's something that is the reason I'm in archives. I started off with the National Park Service that got me started thinking about this topic. And as I moved away from kind of historic sites and museums into archives, um, public services fairly broadly defined is definitely uh, what uh, had me interested in archives and it's the reason that I do this. So it's a topic, like I said, that I get very excited about. <laughs> I definitely like to go to other archives and see what they do and when I see people doing cool stuff, I get really excited about it. So um, when I was preparing to talk to y'all today, um, the more I thought about it, the more I realized kind of how much goes into public services. There's a lot of different components that come together. So I don't wanna overwhelm y'all. Um, and basically, I just wanted to cover the part um, kind of as you're, if y'all are setting up a public services program, um, not really getting into actual patron interaction, um, but getting into, you know, policy setup and reading room setup, that kind of thing. But if y'all have questions about actual patrons, <laughs> we can talk about that too. Um, I just didn't feel like I could, could, could cover all that ground in like an hour, so. As a starting place for, uh, for public services, you'd, uh, it's important to start with a set of documented access policies, written statements um, covering rules and procedures. Um, and obviously, you'd have rules and procedures for all the different domains of archival practice. So I'm sure these are things you all have been hearing about in the other sessions before mine. Um, one of the authors I was reading basically summarized access as who gets to see what and when. Um, this may be particularly important when you're talking about government records um, in terms of restrictions and um, confidentiality, but those are issues when you're dealing with any kind of archival records. Um, when you're coming up with your access policies, the context of your individual repository is going to play heavily into it. So yes, there are um, you know professional standards involved, and actually I, they should be in your binder. I went ahead and printed out for y'all the um, code of ethics the core values, core values and code of ethics for archivists um, and the joint statement of access. So those are some documents I thought would be helpful for y'all to have as kind of guiding documents, kind of a guiding philosophy as you're um, thinking about public services. For the core values and the code of ethics, it, they're actually longer than what I included, so I just included the parts that are kind of most relevant to public services. So when you're setting up your policies, these are definitely things you wanna keep in mind, but a lot of it's also going to be dependent on you know, your individual repository, um, the types of materials you have, um, the mission of the repository, and then the types of cli uh, users and researchers you're going to be having. So all of these kind of come together when you're thinking about policies. Um, and obviously they should re uh, apply all relevant laws. So things like HIPAA, the medical, I forgot what the, what it stands for, but the medical records, yeah, and then there's one for student records as well. So those are just two examples, but there are other laws about you know, public access and confidentiality, so obviously we have to observe those too. It's important to create these policies before anybody actually comes in to use the records. It's tough to come up with this stuff on the fly. <laughs> um, and, and truly, if you have the stuff in place, when people come in, there's an issue, it's nice to be able to say, oh yes, we have a policy, we have a procedure for that, and that can kind of head off potential issues where people feel like they're not you know, um, receiving good service or not receiving access to the materials. So they're important for several reasons, and actually when I was finding this, um, these, some of them I hadn't really thought of on my own, but I hadn't really, yeah, um, in terms of protecting rights of just not of your records creators um, and your donors, um, communicating restrictions to your, to, um, to researchers. I think it's also helpful too just for your staff, especially if you, if you have a large staff. Um, it's easy to, it's hard to sometimes to keep everybody on the same page. So having these things documented and make sure your staff knows what's going on is very helpful also when dealing with patrons and when dealing with donors and that kind of thing. And also, yeah, in, dealing, in reassuring donors, materials will be protected and used um, appropriately in the repository. So there are lots of reasons to go ahead and set these things up initially before, or if you already have patrons <laughs> that you're working with to go ahead and step back maybe and go ahead and look at some of these policies. So this is just to kind of summarize what we've been talking about. Um, this is a quotation from Mary Jo Pugh on, um, on access policies and why they're important. So 
as we've been talking about, they kind of come at the junction of uh, various things. They have um, the competing demands component is is really important. So you have privacy and confidentiality that you have to respect. At the same time, there is this idea of the public right to know. So we want to make as much information as possible open to as many people as possible while still respecting issues of confidentiality and, and privacy. And then there's the um, equality of access issue as well. So that's a very you know, fundamental um, issue to archi archivists that we don't, you know, we're not going to uh, prioritize, well not really that, but um, that we're going to provide equitable service to all of our researchers and make materials open to all different groups of researchers. And as I said too, it's important to consider your institutional context. So there's a lot of kind of professional standards and professional ideas that exist, but you also definitely need to take into account your specific situation at your own repository. So there are several different um, components of an access policy that need to be considered. The first is user communities. So to go ahead and think about and identify um, communities of users um, who will be served by your repository. Um, and I think sometimes this might be helpful to do after you've actually maybe had patrons or maybe to revise as, I've, I've, as you've had patrons. I think archivists in general are prone to thinking that their primary user group is historians, but if you think about it, there really aren't that many of them around <laughs> to keep all of us in business. So I think it ends up being different user groups like genealogists or um, local historians or students. Um, it really would depend on your repository so or members of your parent organization. So I think this is one, this is probably true for all of them, is that this is true for all of them, but especially for this one I think where you might have an initial idea of who your user group is or should be, um, but as you go along, you may go back and say, well, wait a minute, my initial thought really isn't, isn't how this is playing out. Um, but you do want to go ahead and get started thinking about that as you're setting up your policies um, to define user constituencies as broadly as possible. Um, if you're articulating a policy to go ahead and state the principle of, equ of equality of access, um, even, um, even though you're defining your user groups, um, if possible, or to the extent possible, you want to admit users or assist users who may not belong to those primary constituencies, even though you may offer them different services than the other group. Um, a second component of access policy would be um, resources and restrictions. So you basically need to, or would like to want to state um, the types of records held by the repository in a fairly general sense. Also say the types of information that may need to be restricted um, identify applicable laws and institutional policies that apply to information in the repository and append that, append that to your policy. Also indicate how those restrictions will be applied in different scenarios. Uh, the third one is going to be intellectual access and reference services. So describe the finding aids and or catalog records that you have available, um, the levels and types of reference services you'll provide and the relationship between those two things. Um, if, if necessary, also specify distinctions in service levels. Um, also describe searching services, copying services, services for remote users. Um, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, there have been some studies showing that green room use in archives is declining or is down from, from earlier, but a lot of people are contacting archives from, you know, by phone or by email or by, uh, by correspondence also, but by email especially. And so, um, it's important to have, to think through how you're going to handle those types of researchers. I know, especially for smaller archives, sometimes um, they'll put in place limits to how much they'll do for a remote user, um, you know, one hour of research or two hours of research or 30 minutes or have a fee schedule and or have a fee schedule set up for uh, research for remote users. So um, it's important to think that, think that through, I think especially for a small repository. Um, Um, for fees, basically any fees that you would have, <laughs> you need to go ahead and have those thought through and documented. Um, the most common ones are going to be copy services, which could be scans, which could be photocopies. Um, there are all different ways to formulate that and how you how you deliver that service. Do you provide it on a disc? If so, do you provide it? Is there a fee for the disc? Do you email them? Is that free? 
um, copy services ends up involving a whole host of different things. And then when you get into, I think this is another one on the list, the use of information for um, allowing people to publish things from your collections, that's a whole other set of fees potentially for, for usage. So like I said, I've seen different places handle it fairly differently, so there's a lot of options there. Um, but that's the big one that I can think of. But there would other be, potential other fees would be for research, like I said, if you have distance users. Um, and those are the big ones, copy services and research fees. But if you had anything else, you definitely want to document that also. Um, then physical access and conditions of use. Describe how the records will be made available for research. Um, include rules for using materials and policy statements for researchers. So um, some of the common rules for using materials, and this is pretty standard, would be things like um, informing researchers that they can't use a pen or even bring a pen into the reading room, pencils only, um, that they need to lock up their belongings in a locker, um, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, uh, pens, no food, drink, tobacco, that kind of thing in the reading room. Um, usually I mention about supports and uh, supporting um, usually bound volumes in appropriate uh, supports and using weights. Um, usually an instruction about not, uh, about keeping documents flat on the table. So these are all the kind of things that you would want to document in a policy. I think the tricky thing is, is that it can sometimes seem to a researcher and even to, to me sometimes, it's a kind of a, can be kind of a long list when you get into information for users about how to handle this stuff. Um, and I guess I'll just mention now, I was going to mention it later, but I can reiterate it there too. But I think it's, a, I think when you're delivering that to your on-site researchers, I think the delivery is really important to take it from, you know, this kind of overwhelming piece of information to something that you definitely want your researchers to keep take in, uh, keep keep in mind and take seriously, but not have them so paralyzed to handle anything. Um, my experience has been that once you explain these usage rules, um, conditions of use, people usually understand where we're coming coming from as archivists, especially when you say, you know, this document is 200 years old or whatever, we want it to be here for 200 more years for, for future researchers. People usually are pretty understanding, and so when you talk to them about pencil use and that kind of thing, they usually are fairly accommodating. But again, I think the list can get fairly long and it's easy for it to feel like, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Um, and so it's important that we find a way to talk to them, uh, talk to our researchers about this without having them, again, feel so like paralyzed by fear that they can't, don't want to touch anything. Um, another component of your access policy should be um, use of information. So. Um, I mentioned this briefly before, but establish policies to respond to requests for permission to publish from holdings. That's going to be different from just people wanting to get copies for their own personal research. It's a whole other level for them to then take those things and then want to publish them in an exhibit or a website or a book or anything else really. So you have to have another set of policies to deal with that and again fees that accompany them as well. Um, it's advisable to have a um, to provide an example citation for users. Um, they may not follow it, <laughs> but you can, you should, it's important to provide one um, for how you'd like your materials to be cited. Um, yeah, so use of information. And then finally, loan of materials. I don't know, I think in the, out of the list, this may be potentially the, maybe the lowest priority, but it is important to have a set of policies if you're going to be loading things out. Um, you know, by and large, in the archive, the stuff is not going to leave the repository, so this would be an exception if you're going to loan things out for an, I think exhibit would be the main the main thing. Um, but it'd be, it would be good to have those policies in place before someone were to approach you about, about that. Um, but like I said, it's probably not going to happen as regularly as some of the rest of the stuff that's going to play out. Once you have these policies, formulated, documented, enforceable, then you would move on uh, move on into kind of a more reference kind of component, uh, which is actually applying those policies with, with your researchers. I've included two uh, quotations that I really like, emphasizing the importance of records. I, there's been a bit of a shift, I think, in the last maybe like 20 years or so in, our, in the archives profession moving from a focus on the materials to more of a focus on users. So I think the old, and I wasn't 
really around for this, but from what I've heard, the old kind of model was archivist as gatekeeper. You know, we're going to process this stuff, we're going to um, preserve it, and then if you want to use it, you have to kind of get through me. I am the steward of this, and so I don't want to say it was confrontational, but I think it was a bit more, I don't know how to articulate that. <laughs> I'm using a hand gesture, but it was more of a gatekeeper mentality. And I think the mentality now has shifted towards we are processing these things and we are um, preserving these things so that people can use them. It's more of a, a welcoming attitude. It's more encouraging towards people and maybe less standoffish. So I think the mentality now is that your ultimate goal is for use. Um, the I would say the only caveat to that would be that when we're talking about use, again, we're talking about use not just today, but for the next, I, don't, I wouldn't say forever, but the, uh, what's the, the indefinite future. So a lot of the policies we've talked about are really, I think, in place with an eye towards not just current users, but in the future. But again, use has really, I think, become more at the heart of what archivists see themselves as doing. Although, I should also say, not to diminish the other domains of, of archival work, I do think that you know uh, you can't have reference if you haven't done arrangement and description, for example. If you don't have, if you have a bunch of unprocessed collections, there's nothing to provide reference to. So I think that really highlights the importance of that, that domain and then um, you know the finding aids that are being, or catalog records that are being created out of your arrangement description those are the tools that you would use in reference to help guide your researchers. Um, and then Deborah will be talking about ac uh, outreach after this, and that's very much tied into issues of access and reference and things like that. So um, I'm not trying to imply that the other archival domains are not important, <laughs> um, but again, I think they really, uh, when you're approaching them, you know, processing and things, you want to approach them by thinking about um, users and thinking about your researchers. This is kind of a long quotation. I won't read the whole thing. But again, it emphasizes um, that reference fulfills the repository's core mission and underscores the reason for its existence. Um, along, along those lines, along the last sentence about um, building your base of satisfied customers, I, I think that's really important. You know, most people who interact with your repository or a repository, they'll be doing so through the reference archivist. And so they're you know, knowledge of that repository, their um, sense of that repository is really going to be based off of how they interact with the reference archivist, how helpful they were. Um, even things, I think even really small things like just being cheerful and polite and professional, you know, these are all things that are important in any kind of customer service environment and so people are going to form their opinion of your archive based on how they interact with um, with your reference staff as kind of the frontline group of folks. And I think that that really is how you build um, a base of support. Um, the library I came from in San Antonio was kind of a, a stressful <laughs> time while I was there, but um, and the library was under a bit of an attack, but it's the researchers who would come forward and say, you know, I've had personal experience at this library. I've talked to their staff. I've used their collections. I can speak from firsthand experience about all the good work that they do. So I think it's not just when times are difficult, but just in general, you know, your reference interaction is super important. It's really important for um, building uh, a base of, of supporters, which is not why we do it, but it's kind of a side benefit. I think, too, um, my own personal opinion is that uh, archival research is, is difficult, and I think a lot of people who come to an archive are intimidated to be there. Um, and so I think sometimes if they have a bad reference interaction, they might be less inclined to pursue, I wouldn't say that they're gonna never do archival research again, but I think it makes it that much more difficult for them to go on and try to get help with other repositories. So um, not to put too much weight on it, but I do think that because it's so um, I think intimidating for a lot of people that um, it's important to keep that in mind too. I found this uh, list in one of the books I was consulting and I really liked it because it talks about um, all the different types of information we provide when we're doing reference. Um, some of them I 
I'm aware that I do it when I do reference, but I maybe wouldn't have thought of it to put in this list. It's interesting because I think, and I think we've probably all heard people say that because so much information not, is online that there's less need for librarians and less need for archivists, but I think the reverse is actually true, that because there's so much more information out there that um, patrons need reference archivists to help them navigate it. And as you can see, they're, we're not just navigating our own collections. There's our tools, there's our information about the repository, and there's also familiarity with other types of tools and resources that are out there. So there's a lot of different pieces of information that we have to be knowledgeable about when talking to patrons and kind of moving freely throughout them. It can be a little daunting. I started at the Spencer in December, so trying to hit all of these is, <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. And again, we've talked about some of these things for, um, about before, but making things accessible. Um, the, the part about the condition of materials, I hadn't thought about that per se, but I think that that is important. A lot of times for collections, yes, it was processed. Someone probably put their hands on it at some point when they were processing it, but depending on the level of processing or the last time that that was done, you know, someone may not see that document again or that collection again until it's pulled for reference. So that is a good opportunity if you're handing things to patrons. A patron might come to you and say, hey, this doesn't look like it's in very good shape. Or you may notice in kind of um, checking things back in, you might look through something and say, hey, wait a minute, this may need um, better treatment or maybe there was some kind of leak or something that the staff was unaware of and you notice when you pull a box out that, hey, this box is wet or something. So. Like I said, sometimes these reference queries are the only time that these things get moved around, so it's, it is a good opportunity to check and see the condition of the materials. Um, we talked about the public image kind of component to it. And uh, yeah, the, the finding aids and the, the reference service basically help you out so that you're not pulling just unnecessarily 20 boxes where you know the patron only need one, needs only one. So. Um, you know, we don't want to dissuade people from using the materials. We also don't want to have things just being pulled out um, unnecessarily as well. Reference services, some of the ideas that I was, uh, when I was preparing for this, uh, was reading about, talked about um, reference services as being more proactive than kind of reactive. I mean, in some ways you are kind of waiting for people to come and talk to you <laughs> or with their query. Um, but there's also a lot of kind of proactive to component to it as well in terms of encouraging research um, use of the holdings, um, counseling and assisting researchers in an active kind of way, uh, making materials available, um, and also analyzing and measuring research use, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, these are all kind of components of reference services. Um, And again, <laughs> it's funny because when I when you're doing it, when I when I do this, I, or when I was reading about this, I was thinking, yeah, I do do this, but it kind of all blends together, so you're not really conscious of it all the time. But um, I liked this idea from again from Mary Jo Pugh. She talked about the three primary components or dimensions of reference services. So the intellectual component um, breaking down into three other areas. Um, one was facilitating research, which is kind of obvious that so we're assisting researchers in. Um, finding information about the repository, about the records creators, about the records themselves. Um, we're also undertaking research ourselves. So sometimes, you know, a reference query may lead us to do more research um, about something or also for exhibits and that kind of thing, which is a little bit beyond the scope of, of my talk. But if you're doing an exhibit or a brochure or any kind of other um, material like that, you'll be undertaking your own research about the facility or about um, records creators or about the collections. And also educating research, uh, educating users. Every time you're working with a researcher, it's a chance to not just educate them about or talk to them about their research topic, but to also educate them about archives in general. Again, a lot of people, there have been studies that people don't, are not very familiar with archives and a lot of um, archives terminology. So things that we talk about, you know, finding aids, people come to you and they don't know what that is. Um, and so whenever you're talking to a researcher, it's important to, first of all, kind of be aware that common archives jargon is not really common for anybody, anybody else but us. Um, and to, my tactic is always to try to define that term for people so that, um, 
going forward, you know, they'll, if someone says fine a to them, that they'll then say, oh, I've heard that term before. I maybe have a better sense of what some of these terms mean. So I think when you're talking to researchers, it's good to try to um, educate them and try to uh, instruct them about archives in general, not just your own specific repository. So that again, as they, as they head out and do more research, they're more comfortable in archives and with, with the tools and with the collections. And again, with the handling, the same thing as well. I think as, they, as people get more comfortable handling these materials um, and, and become more familiar with those rules and guidelines for handling, that they are more comfortable. Um, the human interpersonal component is a large part, obviously, of um, reference interaction. Communication is <laughs> also obviously extremely important. Um, just kind of at all at all stages of the process because you're trying to communicate rules and policies to your researcher. I think it's really important to kind of to be very upfront about those procedures. I don't like to be surprised personally about, you know, surprise fees or surprise rules. So I think it's always important to lay those things out up front so people know what they're getting into. So you're trying to communicate those policies and procedures again in a way that's, you know, firm and in a way that's um, uh, serious, but not in a way that's kind of overly strict, not overly strict, but overly, I don't know, uh, I'm totally blanking. <laughs> I guess overly strict, but that's not really what I mean. Um, the other component too is obviously the research question itself. So someone will come to you with a query and it can take a lot of dialogue to really get to what that person is trying to um, trying to get at. They may present you with one question and then as you question them more about it, you find that they're really interested in something else a little bit differently. So just that dialogue with your researcher and it's gonna be different every single person that you have come in. Um, but trying to get at what they're looking for and what they need um, can, can be a bit of dialogue, a lot of listening and a lot of kind of repeating what they're saying and reformulating and repeating it back to them. So. Um, that's kind of at the heart of <laughs> reference interaction is that um, human interpersonal component. And then the administrative component is kind of underneath all of this. At the same time that you're trying to talk to your researchers and talk to them about their query, there's kind of a layer of administrative work that you have to be mindful of as well. There's, there's forms, and I'll talk more specifically about that in a moment, but there are a lot of forms and kind of keeping track of where people are, where your materials are, making sure the documentation is all in place. That's all going on behind the scenes as you're you know, trying to focus on your researcher. You have to be mindful of these, of these other things as well. After you have, we've talked about policies, we've talked about um, kind of underlying philosophies of reference. Um, it's important to have a space for your researchers to work. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, today as well. Um, I think in an ideal setting, people would have a reading room, a specific room set aside for researchers. That's not always possible, but it is important to have a sp at least a space designated for use by your researchers. Um, and one of the most important things is that it's secure from kind of a variety of um, standpoints. Records are most at risk when they're in active use. So there's a lot of opportunity <laughs> for them to be damaged or God forbid, stolen or something when they're in the reference space or the reading room space. So the secure component is, is very important. Um, so the first thing is, I will go, th go ahead and go through these kind of one by one, um, having, a, having your reading room separate from your stack space. Um, I think ideally you'd have a closed stack space. The other component too is I'm sure Roberta talked yesterday about having climate controlled stacks areas for your, um, for the collections. Um, and obviously, you know, that's not necessary for the patrons to be sitting there. So having that division is important for that as well. Um, but we don't uh, allow our researchers to, br you know, browse um, the way they would like in a public library or something, which again is something that people might find a little off-putting, but again, it may require some explanation. Um, the limited entrances and ex exits is just, again, to maintain, uh, keep an eye on who's coming and going into the reading room uh, to better monitor, you know, who's taking what in and out of the space. 
Um, the lockers are important. Um, it's standard to have people go ahead and lock up coats, backpacks, um, laptop cases, any container that someone could really kind of take things out of um, to go ahead and have people lock that up. That can be another bone of contention. People are sometimes a little bit t taken aback why, they, why you want them to hand over their stuff. <laughs> um, and again, it, it's nice if you have a written policy saying, you know, it's not you personally, we suspect it's an overriding policy that we do this for security purposes. I, the library I came from also required people to lock up um, cell phones, which I don't believe we do at the Spencer. So I think there are some things it's a matter of kind of personal, or not personal, but you know, your repository, what you all decide to do. Um, I don't know why, I think the cell phones was just a respect for other researchers. It's a kind of a less security issue, um, but that's something that you could kind of decide for your repository. Um, the UV filters are important. I don't know if Roberta talked about light damage yesterday. Um, so when things are out being used, um, the filters are important. I know too, um, the library I came from, our exhibit space, such as it was, was actually our reading room. So we didn't have a separate exhibit space with you know, fancy lights and things. So especially if you're going to be displaying materials for any length of time in your reading room or in your reference space, the UV um, filters on the lights are gonna be very important. You want to have all your policies available to researchers while they're in the reading room, either printed up on, on the tables or at the reference desk, or um, if you have a website, you can also get to them from there, or some combination. I know at the Spencer and at my old library, too, we had brochures. We also had our website, so people can usually get to them from various um, points, but it's important that people can get to them while they're actually at your repository. And including copyright, that's kind of the big thing. When you have, especially if, if you have a station for um, patrons to make their own copies, the copyright notice is important to have there. Um, obviously a workstation for the reference archivist on duty, there should always be a reference archivist or archivist there in the reference space while there are researchers there. Um, I think it's usually, I guess ideally, to have more than one if people need to go pull things from the stacks. It, I guess it depends on the setup of your individual repository, but um, the two places I've worked at um, usually try to have two people, um, either a staff member and a student worker or two staff mem members, again, so as people went and pulled things, there was always one person at least there to kind of keep an eye on things. Also important for your for the tables for the patrons to consider that you that the from the perspective of the uh, reference desk that you can see everybody and kind of see what they're doing. <laughs> um, at, uh, Spencer, we have everybody facing the front, kind of like this actually, um, or I think I've seen it too where it's um, facing this way, but you wanna make sure that you can see what everybody's working on and no one's hidden by things like pillars and that kind of stuff. Along the lines of the table, it's also important to have tables for oversized materials or be able to move tables around to create oversized tables. Maps and architectural records are as you can imagine, are very difficult to handle and it's important to have a surface large enough that people can go ahead and access those materials safely. The list of equipment can get a little bit lengthy, <laughs> so in an ideal in that setting, um, have you know photocopiers, scanners, a microfilm reader if you have microfilm in your collection, um, and then AV equipment if you have AV equipment or AV um, materials in your collection also. Because again, if people, someone wants to come in and use a cassette tape, ideally, you know, to have equipment to go ahead and play those materials for them. The final list is, um, you know, tools just to help uh, facilitate safe access of the material. So things like magnifying glasses, um, gloves for using photographs, um, book trucks to, uh, so as you bring materials from your stacks or from one table to the next, they can be uh, carried safely. Um, cradles and supports for published uh, printed materials and books. Um, weights to keep pages open safely. Um, pencils, people sometimes don't bring their own, so it's important to have a stash there for your researchers. Spencer does not provide note paper, but my old library did, so that's an optional thing if people sometimes don't have their own paper to use. Um, and out cards for your, for your boxes. So um, to go ahead and have a good supply of that for, for staff members and for researchers. I guess I should say too, I didn't uh, think about this, the other component for a secure reading room is us. As the archivists, we're kind of the, um, 
maybe not the most important thing, but certainly a very important component of a secure reading room is having an archivist there who's being aware of kind of what's going on. Um, and again, not in a, you don't want people to feel like they're being, you know, having someone peer over their shoulder at what they're doing, but, you know, to keep, keep vigilant without seeming um, kind of domineering about it. But we're a very important, as archivists, a very important component of um, a secure space. Also to have a, um, a, a comfortable reference space. So we've talked about accessibility to all researchers. Um, I know for sometimes spaces that are older, uh, patrons with disabilities can be, um, can be a bit of a challenge, but it's important to find a way to enable those researchers to come and use your collections. Um, appropriate noise level. I think that that's kind of <laughs> maybe a repository specific uh, situation to an extent, um, what different repositories are comfortable with. Um, I know at Spencer we have um, a side room where it's a fairly big reading room but have a separate space for group work, which is important since we have so many students. Um, and we have, at uh, my previous library in San Antonio, we didn't really have student groups, but we would have family groups come in and do genealogy, and that'd be kind of fun. There'd be four or five people sitting around looking at the material. So we're, we were pretty loose about noise. People didn't have to necessarily whisper, but you wouldn't have to kind of think through. People can get a little bit um, irritated sometimes if it gets too loud. So um, whatever is appropriate to your repository. Um, having some kind of reference collection, uh, whatever is appropriate to your repository, public work computers. Um, the square footage is what's recommended, if possible, and that's your table, your chair for your researcher, and then space to get those book trucks around in the aisles. Um, and then comfortable chairs. One of the books I was using pointed out that sometimes researchers will be there for days and days, so it's helpful, but maybe not <laughs> always possible to supply kind of comfortable spaces for them to use and for your staff if possible. And then finally, okay. um, while you do definitely want to have a secure secure uh, reference space and a comfortable one, I think it also needs to be, you know, again, we talked about it being welcoming. Um, uh, in uh, the Pew book I've been uh, using other places. She said that the built environment, she was quoting somebody else as saying, the built environment and the way it is maintained is rich in sensory clues that tell visitors about the nature of the place they are in. So you can really communicate a lot to your researchers about um, that, they, that they belong there, kind of in a way. I've had people come um, into the library before and say, oh, am I, am I in the right place? Am I even allowed in here? And so it's important to be able to communicate to them that yes, this is the place that you belong and we welcome you to come here. Um, something, something that's easy as signs can be really important. It's kind of amazing how sometimes bad signage can be for archives, especially if we're tucked away in a corner or a basement or something, um, to make sure that people know, you know, that as they wander down this hallway or whatever, that they are headed towards the archives and we're welcoming there. Again, I think the archivist on duty is a big component of creating that welcoming environment and just the demeanor of that we portray to our um, our researchers is a really really goes a long way towards communicating to our researchers. You know, we're glad you're here. Come on in, use what we have. You know, that kind of thing. So I feel like by this point I may be overwhelming you all with lists of all these policies and things. Some of the things on this list we've kind of hit at different places, but this is a list of. Um, statements and forms that your uh, researchers need to see somehow, some way. Ideally, I think it's important in this day and age to have a website, if possible, or a page on your parent organization's website. Um, so a lot of this would go there, things like, you know, parking and directions and things like that. Um, I don't know, do all of you, do, is that, so do all of you have websites for your archives or is it something that a lot of you all don't have? Okay. There's also a lot of, I don't know if Deborah's gonna get into this at all, but um, there's a lot of options for, to do it for free. I think I've seen some repositories use uh, WordPress, which is a blog software, but it's free. People can use that for their websites. Um, even social media like you know Facebook, 
that kind of thing, just finding some way to get that information out there online for your researchers. Um, a lot of the forums, I think, end up going into co copying, photocopy requests, um, these instructions. That gets to be a whole other, I think, kind of component um, in terms of handling things correctly, in terms of are you going to allow researchers to copy things themselves. This is kind of the, the big thing right now is allowing um, researchers to use digital cameras to copy their own materials. Um, at the Spencer, we do allow that with some procedures in place. At my previous library, we didn't allow it really at all, which was kind of tough. So that's kind of a, a newer dimension of this. Um, but again, copying seems to encompass a whole lot of different components, and again, copyright plays into that as well. So um, I could do a whole hour on that probably, <laughs> just copying stuff. Um, you wouldn't think photocopying would be that big of a challenge, but there's a lot involved. Um, but again, I think everything else we've kind of talked about. For registration, I didn't, well, we'll get to that in a minute. And I just wanted to, I didn't want to get too much into this um, because of the time we have. I did like this chart from one of the books that I had um, on the reference process. And this gets back to some of the forms. When your researchers come in, um, it's important to go ahead and have them present photo ID the first time that they come in. That's pretty standard procedure for archives to have. Um, it could be a driver's license or a student ID or a military ID, a passport, you know, whatever. Um, and also to, uh, as part of this identity thing, to have them register. So either have a paper registration um, or to have, if you have an online system of some kind, to have them use that. But to basically have them register as a user and to record their, their name, their contact information, um, their affiliated institution if they have. Okay. Um, no, I, I think I'm supposed to repeat the question. The question what, for the recording, the question was about why we have people show photo ID. I, the reason I've always heard and <laughs> is mostly for security. So if something were to happen to something that you could confirm who saw it last um, and confirm who, who your researchers are, if there's, it's more for there being a problem, I think, than anything else. I've never seen it for keeping people out. Um, I guess, I guess, there could be a situation. I know at, at certain libraries, if there's a known person who's been to your repository and they're a known thief, <laughs> you know, and you have a list saying so and so is a convicted thief, do not let them come, and then they come, you'd be able to identify that person. Deborah, did you wanna? Oh, so um, I think it's most. I don't. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think the the photo. Oh, go ahead. Again, I think, I think it's mostly in case something were to come up missing, you could go back and backtrack because the registration is then linked as you get further into the process when you track um, who's using what materials. There's usually a call slip involved, um, a paper call slip. So you would have the call slip that says, you know, John Smith requested the XYZ collection box one, and then you have his registration form about that patron. So there's a paper trail basically linking this person to this collection on this date. Um, so if something were to happen, you could go back and backtrack, you know, what happened. And, and it's not always a nefarious thing. I know sometimes even things might get misfiled incorrectly. I did that one time at my old library. At my old library, um, and I had two things, and I accidentally put the one folder with the other folder, and so I had to go back and see that I was the last person to touch the collection, <laughs> and see what was the other thing I had pulled, and then I checked the other thing, and there was the. I shouldn't really admit to that, but um, just sometimes it's who touched it last, in case something were to turn up missing, and maybe it's something as simple as it was misfiled. So it's not always, you know, theft, but that's kind of the main the main thing. And again, yeah, I agree with Deborah. I think that seeing, I think the photo ID is a pretty standard, a pretty standard thing. Um, and again, the uh, registration form too. So name, contact information. Um, I'm trying to think it's Spencer. I think everybody has a, a number in the system. Uh, my previous library did, uh, did as well. So you're gonna keep a form on all researchers. And I think we keep those indefinitely, although I'd have to go look that up. As you're, yeah, there, there are different ways to do it to make sure they don't have to do the same thing every time. Um, at 
Spencer, we actually have an automated system. So once they come in, you know, the first time, they could either create their registration at home or do it when they come, and then it's saved there, and then they don't do it again. They come in the next time and say, I've registered. They give us their name when we find it. Um, at the DRT library where I was, we had a content management system, but we also had paper registration forms that the staff manually entered into the system. But the sheet on the front was the registration, and then on the back was a listing of all the dates that they came in. So the first time we did the ID thing and we had the registration form filled out, and then subsequently they would come in and say, oh, I've been here before. We would just find their sheet and then add the new date in and out to the back of the sheet. So there's different ways to go about it, but I think Pat's right that by and large, this is the kind of the first time somebody comes in, they do the whole process, and then if they come back, unless something changes and they have to update it, by and large, that's kind of a one-time thing. Yeah. Which is nice to tell them, too, because, again, sometimes people kind of balk at giving you information and balk at having to sit there and fill the form out. Um, but So it can be important to even tell the patron, this is a one-time deal, you know, if you can just bear with us at this beginning point. You know, um, you want to do this when you come back. I think the only thing I wanted to say too, because is the, the more administrative component and some of the paperwork. Um, I mentioned call slips, so um, to have a system of tracking um, what patrons are requesting from your stacks and what they're using, and then to track that you've gotten it back. So, um, and again, these can take um, different forms um, at. DRT library, which was smaller, we had just a paper form people filled out with title, call number, well, I think the content of the call slip is basically the same. The person, the researcher's name, um, the name of the collection, the call number, and usually a box number, um, especially if it's a large collection, you know, is it box one or box two out of 50, you know, it's kind of helpful to know that. Um, and then again, use that document as the reference library and to go into the stacks, pull the item, document that that item has been removed from the stacks, bring it out, um, usually kind of look at it before you hand it over to the patron, and then use the call slip to track it back from the patron through you back to the stacks, possibly through copy, uh, through photocopying. I think that's, I also like this chart, I didn't want to go over it line by line, but I liked the chart in terms of, you know, the diff the two perspectives of the researcher and the archivist, you know, um, in some ways, we're all working towards the same kind of goal, which is helping the researcher find that information. But again, we have to be, we have to be mindful that we have other considerations too as reference archivists. But it is important to to not be a barrier. <laughs> to I was reading that somewhere too that the the reference archivist is not a barrier or a gatekeeper, but rather a partner and a facilitator and a guide in the research process. So that's about all I had. The last couple of slides, I did include um, some references and some resources. The first two on this list, and I don't know if anybody else in the workshop has mentioned them, are kind of general. They're really good one-volume guides to archi archival programs um, that cover all the different domains. The third volume down there, the Mary Jo Pugh, is specific to reference services. It's part of a series put out by the Society of American Archivists called um, Archival Fundamental Series 2. It's about seven, seven or eight volumes, and they're great, but the first two are kind of a nice one volume that encompass all of those different domains. For additional information, the Society of American Archivists, I don't know if this has come up before, but I thought I would mention it. You can join their main listserv without being a member of SAA, which can be a little bit pricey, and you can also join the roundtable discussion emails. The one I would recommend is the Loner Rangers. Um, I don't know if that term has come up in the workshop, or you all have heard of that before. It's archival humor, you know, arrangement and description, Loner, yeah. <laughs> it's, if, you're, if you're the only person in your repository, or if you're in a very small shop, you're called the Loner Ranger. So um, they're, they're a great group, and I think this is, <laughs> the, the main listserv is really wonderful. Um, it can be, I find it a little bit overwhelming, and the Lone Ranger group has, I would say, sometimes different considerations than the main, the main one. So again, they're, they're both helpful, but Lone Rangers is the round table that I have found to be helpful. Um, before coming to Spencer, I was a Lone Ranger, so.
Um, there's also a standards portal on the SAA website, which has, that's how I, that's where the, um, uh, the joint stack statement on access is located. There's also a standard for, I believe there's a standard for um, patrons with, dis with disabilities. And then there are standards for all the other areas of the, all the other archival domains as well. Um, and then the, the last one, the using archives, the guide to research, I think is helpful. Um, I created something like that on the website for my last library, um, kind of a guide for researchers who are new to the archival process. And so I think the ones I pulled were from, I think, Yale and like UNC, um, but this is also a great one too if you wanna just use it for yourself or make it available to your patrons if they need additional information about conducting research, it's kind of a nice source to have. And the last, the last two, um, Society of Georgia Archivists has a forums forum, um, again, not just for, um, for reference, but for all the different areas, people can submit their form. So if you need to create a registration form or create a call slip or create these other records we've been talking about, um, you can find some examples there on the forms forum. The last document is an article from OCLC. I talked about digital camera use. That's kind of, at this point, it might not be all that, all that new. We just didn't do it at DRT library, um, but the nice thing about the report, well, it points out that I think the vast majority of archives do allow some kind of camera use. So if you think you might want to allow that in your repository, uh, it talks about that and it outlines, walks you through the components of a policy and has kind of three options, a conservative option, a kind of middle of the road option, and a more liberal option. So you can go through kind of piece by piece of the camera policy and select kind of how you would piece that together depending on what you think is best for your repository. So it's kind of a module way of formulating one. So I thought that might be helpful if anyone's thinking about um, implementing that at the repository. So I think I'm out of time. <laughs> um, but I had an activity prepared, and, um, but you all can take it with you. It was the assessment. And as I was coming up with it um, from the Hunter source, or uh, the Deerstein source, I thought this is kind of overwhelming. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, d I wanted to mention that if you're, if you're taking it and you do it, um, it's, it's not meant to imply that everyone should have all of this checked yes by the time you open your door to researchers. As I was creating it and thinking back to the place I came from, which I'm more familiar with, we don't have all the, we were, that library's been there for 60 years, and I think there are definitely places where I was thinking, oh, we should really have a better policy about that, you know? So it's definitely a document that I think is good to start with and see kind of where you're at. And definitely, I think everyone, even, you know, I think every repository who would do this would find areas of improvement. So it's a good way to just kind of see where you're at and see um, maybe to prioritize as you're going forward. Oh, you know, there's a cluster of things we should focus on going forward. So I just didn't want you all to be overwhelmed if you're looking at it and thinking, oh my gosh, there's a lot, a lot to consider, um, but just as a way to assess kind of where you're at and to look at going forward. Does anybody have any questions? I didn't mean to take up all my time, but. Does anybody have a question? Okay. Well, if anybody has, I think my contact information is in the binder, right? So if anybody has a question, um, feel free to email me. And also, if anyone's ever in Lawrence and wants a tour of our repository to get a sense of, you know, talking about the secure reading room or whatever, if you want to get a sense of how we do it at Spencer, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to take you through and show you around and answer any questions you might have about, about Spencer.